from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable. We are all evil in some form or another. Yes, I am not 100%, but I am evil. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. This is Serial Killing, a podcast. Hello again, and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast. This is Alyssa Carroll, and I am your host and the creator of at serial underscore killing on Instagram, where we go through the life stories of serial killers to see if we might catch a glimpse of why they displayed their famous vile and disturbing behaviors. This week's podcast will be on Gordon Northcott. Now there are a lot of players in this story. Gordon is of course the main character, but Gordon's mother, his sister, his nephew, and others are in this as well. It might begin to get a little confusing, so I'll do my best to put in reminders of who is who. Also, this podcast will be difficult to listen to. It involves the mistreatment and murder of children. If you think, even for a moment, that this might be too disturbing for you, then it probably is. By all means, skip this one. I understand. It's hard for me to discuss these cases about children. We'll still be friends, no harm, no foul. Are you still with me? Okay. A great deal of my source material is from the book, quote, The Road Out of Hell, Sanford Clark and the True Story of the Wineville Murders by Anthony Flacco. I highly recommend this book. I could not put it down. I was already familiar with the case, but this book goes into heart-wrenching detail it absolutely and completely broke my heart, but it is also a really good read. So let's get started. Gordon Stewart Northcott was born on November 9th, 1906, making him a Scorpio in Bladworth, Saskatchewan, Canada. Now, as I have gone over the turn of the century history in past podcasts a couple of times, We'll skip that section and we'll get right into the story. So Gordon's parents were Cyrus and Sarah Northcott. His mother, Sarah Louise Cawthorpe Northcott, was born in 1869 in Ontario, Canada, and her background and family history are actually pretty fascinating. According to Shoggoth.net, Sarah was born into a middle-class Canadian family of mixed heritage. However, one of her grandmothers was named, and pardon me if I butcher this pronunciation, but her name was Gull Moore. Now, in 1832, she was apparently fleeing the Orkney Islands, which are located just north of Scotland's mainland, for being persecuted by the Catholic Church for witchcraft. His father, Cyrus George Northcott, who went by George, we'll, we'll call him George for the story, was born in 1866 in Ontario, Canada. His parents were also native to the area. He was one of several siblings, and it is said that George was a prosperous merchant who worked in construction, and that's pretty much all the information I could find out about his father. Gordon's parents got married in 1886 when they were 20 and 17 years old, respectively. In her early 20s, Sarah was diagnosed with cardiomyopathy, which is an issue with the heart muscle, making it hard for your heart to pump blood to the rest of your body. It is caused by a mutation or change in some of the genes in the heart muscle proteins. People with cardiomyopathy experience shortness of breath, fatigue, their ankles, feet, and abdomen and veins in their neck will swell, and they experience dizziness or lightheadedness, irregular heartbeats, and possibly chest pains if they exert themselves too much. So after Sarah and George got married, they had their first child, Louise Winifred Northcott, who went by Winifred or Winnie. 
and she was born on June 23, 1888. Now, most sources say that George and Sarah only had two children, but there were a few that said they had a total of five. And since I was not able to verify for certain either way, we're just going to leave it at the two that pertain to this story, Gordon and Winifred. Now, as we know, Gordon was born on November 9th, 1906. So at the time of his birth, his big sister Winifred would have been 18 years old, which leads us to the next scandal. It is a well-established theory that George had sexually abused Winifred and she became pregnant with Gordon, that he was the product of incest. Both Gordon and his mother Sarah would later testify to this, but Winifred completely denied it. Little is known of Gordon's very early years. He did claim that he was also sexually abused by their father at 10 years old. But then again, Gordon was well known for being a liar. He was also a well-known troublemaker as a child. He was coddled and revered by Sarah, his mother, nearly worshiped, and was a more feminine boy. Gordon later said that his mother dressed him in girls' clothes until he was 16 years old, but again, that was most likely a lie. But Gordon did have some talent playing the piano and thought of himself as an aspiring professional pianist. Also, at some point, the family moved to British Columbia for a while, but when Gordon was 18, he decided he wanted to leave Canada and move south to Los Angeles, California. Now, rumor had it that Gordon wanted to leave the area because some of the local parents were furious at the physical and sexual abuse that Gordon had doled out to their young sons. Also, Gordon wanted to be a professional pianist. He had played some in small local orchestras, but he thought of himself as supremely talented and the original plan was to go to Hollywood and become a famous musician. He dressed himself very well for someone of average means and was particular about his hands always being clean and well manicured. He was a fairly attractive young man and he was also very aware of that. Calling him conceited doesn't quite encompass just how he saw himself. So let's analyze what little we know of his childhood. And although we don't know much about it, I think we can still pretty well see what kind of child he was. While he said that his father sexually abused him at 10 years old, signs point to that being a lie. But of course we can't be sure. Gordon's mother, Sarah, was nearly obsessed with her son. Sarah also said that her husband raped their daughter Winifred, resulting in Gordon's conception due to incest. Now, whether or not any of this is true, we just don't know. What we do know is that for whatever reason, parts of this family had a near obsession with sex. Gordon and his mother had an almost, quote, Norma and Norman Bates kind of relationship. And we all know how that turned out. When Gordon would misbehave, he would nearly regress into a small child whimpering and crying and his mother would coddle him and tell them that, of course it was not his fault. Sarah never held Gordon accountable for his horrid behavior. So let's look at that. Accountability is applying consequences for an undesirable behavior. This is how we teach children about right, wrong and social rules that they will have to live by. Accountability and discipline are vital for the healthy and well-adjusted development of a child. It's just as important as love, food, shelter, and so on. Without these skills, kids lack the tools necessary to understand how to function properly in relationships and they face very real challenges in life, such as a lack of self-discipline and respect for others, and the ability to cooperate and compromise with others. And though it might surprise some people, not holding children accountable leads to that child being very unhappy. They are often angry and resentful. 
they also don't learn to regulate their negative impulses and they give in to temptation much more readily. They don't respect authority, they act inappropriately, they are willful, selfish, and they lack crucial social skills. But the most troubling part is that they don't learn empathy and have a severe lack of self-control. So when children grow up with a lack of empathy, they are unable to step outside of themselves and relate to other people's experiences, how they feel, how they think and believe. You can see how this would be a very bad thing. Then on top of that, it seems pretty obvious that Gordon had some underlying pathology. According to Dr. Clarissa Cole, Gordon was a pedophile, a psychopath, and a sexual sadist. She concluded that his sexual sadism was the leading contributor to his torture and murder of all of these young boys, which we'll get into momentarily. Now, pedophilia and psychopathy alone do not generally lead to murder. Sadists like to control, demean, belittle, humiliate, and hurt people. And this fits Gordon to a T. This, coupled with his parents' lack of discipline, led to him even victimizing his own family members to get what he wanted. We start this story with Gordon being 18 years old, and that meant that his sister Winifred was already 36. She had long been married and had children of her own by this point. Now I'm not sure how many children she had, but we know that Winifred had at least one daughter named Jessie and two sons, Kenneth and Sanford. By the time Gordon and his parents had decided to move to Los Angeles and settle in, Sanford was 13 years old, and then Kenneth was his younger brother. Not finding any success in the music industry as a pianist, the now 20-year-old Gordon made the trip back up to Canada in his yellow Buick convertible to his sister's house with the intention of bringing one of his nephews back with him. Sanford later stated that just like his grandmother Sarah, his mother Winifred ruled the roost. Sanford's father had, in the beginning, tried to stand up for himself against his wife Winifred, but she had a mean mouth and he learned to just be quiet and leave her be. So at first, Sanford, Gordon's nephew, was told that he would be taking a road trip with his uncle just a few hundred miles away. Then he was told by his mother, Winifred, that he was going to be moving to Los Angeles, California with his uncle Gordon and that it would be this big, wonderful adventure. Sanford knew that his mother was just sending him away. I mean, he wasn't stupid. Gordon and Winifred spoke in hushed tones. They giggled and they started acting kind of strange and this made Sanford very uncomfortable. Winifred also told her son that he would be helping his uncle Gordon with a chicken farm that they were building and that it would be a good opportunity for Sanford to learn the meaning of a hard day's work. Gordon had asked his father to help him buy about a little bit of land, three acres worth, just outside of LA, which he did, then helped him build a chicken ranch in nearby Wineville. Sanford, at this time 13 years old, knew that something wasn't right. He knew his uncle would want no part of living in the desert where it was dirty, nearly completely secluded from civilization, where he wouldn't get the constant social attention that he craved, and he'd be working with chickens, which is dirty work. I mean, this meant stinking, filthy, dirty work. He wondered why all of a sudden Gordon was just okay with this. Also, Gordon had been visiting Winifred and the family for nearly two weeks and it had been quite obvious that Gordon had actually wanted to take Sanford's little brother Kenneth back with him. But Kenneth was Winifred's most cherished child and she did nothing to hide that fact and she flat out refused to let Gordon take him. So Sanford would just have to do. Now, Sanford desperately did not want to go. He was well aware of his uncle's, let's say, interest in young boys, as did the rest of the family. He pled his case, saying his friends were here and anything else he could think of, but his mother would hear none of it. 
Gordon turned to him and said that once they got back to the farm, he would enroll him in Boy Scouts in school so that he could make new friends and he would help him with his, quote, character development. Sanford later stated that he tried to make eye contact with his father to help him, you know, just the pleading in the eyes. But it was obvious that his father, sitting in a chair and reading a newspaper, was purposefully ignoring the entire conversation. Gordon did notice that his nephew was displeased and he joked, he often joked, that he was going to have to toughen the teenager up. He was laughing. But this time Winifred didn't laugh along. Finally, Sanford's father did speak up and he said he did not like the idea of Gordon taking his son to California. The father did not trust Gordon at all. I mean, clearly. But Winifred was enraged. She emasculated her husband in front of everyone in the room, effectively silencing him back into submission. Winifred's daughter, Jessie, was 17 at this time, but wasn't quite out on her own yet, so Sanford couldn't go with her. It was settled. Gordon would be taking his nephew back with him to the chicken farm. Now, the experience of riding with Gordon in that car from Canada all the way south through the States to Los Angeles told him what he already figured. Gordon spoke loudly and nearly nonstop the entire trip. If he thought Sanford wasn't paying close enough attention, he would hit him so hard in the head that the poor boy would see stars or feel like he was going to black out. Once Gordon and Sanford arrived in Los Angeles and to Sarah and George's house, Gordon's parents, Sarah didn't even acknowledge her own grandson. But she did come running, made a big show of coming and running up to Gordon, embracing him as if he'd been gone for centuries. She exclaimed her relief of her son being back home loudly enough for anyone with an earshot to be well aware. Sarah was just as loud and dramatic as Winifred. And also, the beatings from Gordon began the day Sanford arrived. The young nephew learned very quickly that if he stayed as invisible and as quiet as possible, he would generally be left alone for long periods of time. But it didn't take long for Gordon to up the ante. He began sexually assaulting and raping the young teen, and when it was over, he would exclaim to Sanford, quote, stick with the devil you know, pal, unquote. The way that Gordon was able to keep Sanford quiet about this abuse was to threaten him with how he was an illegal immigrant from Canada with no papers like Gordon and his parents had, that he would be arrested and put in prison where he would be sexually assaulted tenfold what he had to endure from his uncle. Then it was time to head out east into the desert to the three little acres that would soon be a running chicken farm. George had already arranged for the construction crew to come out and begin building. Before they had left, Sarah informed Sanford that he had better do nearly all of the work on that farm because she didn't want to see even one callus on Gordon's hands. He was meant for bigger and better things. A famous pianist could not have dirty and calloused hands. After they began to be settled on the farm, buildings erected and chickens had begun to arrive, Gordon began violently beating and raping Sanford. And when Gordon was done, he locked Sanford into one of the chicken coops and told him if he attempted to run, he would break both of his legs. Later that same night, as Sanford was in and out of consciousness, He was awakened by Gordon driving back onto the property after leaving for a couple of hours. Gordon had actually gone back into town and taken another young boy, brought him back and locked him in another chicken coop next to Sanford, who, after a few minutes, heard screams coming from the next little room. Sanford realized right then and there what this whole chicken farm charade was actually for and it dawned on him that his grandparents knew that their son was a monster at least knew on some level and put him out in the middle of nowhere 
purposefully so that Gordon could do as he pleased without detection. Now that Gordon had another boy imprisoned in one of the coops, he actually laid off of Sanford for the most part. Gordon instructed him to take care of the daily chores of feeding and watering the chickens, cleaning all of the coops, save the one, of course, and the household chores. Sanford felt absolutely horrible because, on one hand, he was relieved to be left alone, but on the other, he knew it was only because his uncle Gordon had another boy locked up. One evening, Gordon forced Sanford to take a can of beans into the coop where the other boy was. He immediately saw that the boy was around his own age and was clearly from Mexico. The boy began to plead with Sanford to free him, speaking only in Spanish, but Sanford was entirely too scared to do anything. He left the coop and went back into the tent that he and Gordon were sleeping in while the house was finished being built. The next morning, Gordon was gone. Sanford woke up. He saw that he was alone in the tent. He went out to the coop to check on the boy and saw that the boy was gone too. He thought that maybe his uncle Gordon had decided to take the boy back to wherever he was from and let him go. Sanford went about his day of doing chores. Gordon finally returned that evening in a better mood than Sanford had ever seen him. Gordon was dancing around the fire pit as the sun set, talking cryptically about how to get rid of a dead body. As the chicken farm began its finishing touches, the house was built and completed, goats brought in to keep the weeds and the brush back, and hundreds of chickens were already laying eggs, Gordon Northcott's savage sexual attacks on his nephew grew in frequency and intensity. Most times he locked Sanford up inside one of the coops, chained to the wall or chained to the floor. Sanford had begun to lose weight rapidly, along with his will to live. Gordon began abducting young boys pretty regularly, beating and raping them. Then he would decide that they were a liability and then they just had to go. Then it was just a roll of the dice as to whether or not the boys were dumped off somewhere or allowed to live or murdered. It has been said that he also, quote, rented out his young victims to wealthy pedophiles, but we can't be 100% sure of that. But one night, Sanford had awakened to a particularly horrible assault to find that the chicken coop door had been left open. He didn't know what to do. Was it a trick? Was it left open by mistake? He just didn't know. All he knew was that he needed to get the hell out of there. He managed to get his sore and battered body off of the floor and out of the animal feces and walk out of the coop. He listened carefully to hear any sign of movement, but there was none. Finally, assured that he was alone, he took off and ran away from the farm. He didn't get far though, because his body was already so very weak, on top of him knowing he had no place to go. Los Angeles was too far to walk to. He knew he'd never make it. The desert would kill him before he ever got there. So begrudgingly, he walked back to the farm and snuck into the house and went to bed. That morning, he was awakened to boiling water poured over his back. He screamed in agony, but he immediately knew why. Gordon had somehow found out that he had left the property. Gordon then forced Sanford to dig a pit out in the chicken run. Then he bludgeoned him in the head, knocking him out. He put him in the pit and then put boards over the pit and then something heavy to hold the boards down, effectively imprisoning Sanford in a kind of grave. He was able to breathe through the spaces between the boards once he regained consciousness. One time, while out looking for a new victim, Gordon spotted a young teenage Hispanic boy and decided he wanted him. He took the boy back to the farm where he locked him and chained him up in the chicken coop and assaulted the boy repeatedly the entire night. Now, Gordon's parents were also there visiting, and there is just no possible way that they did not hear this boy screaming for hours into the night. After a week, 
Gordon grew bored with the teen and his mother suggested that the boy had to die. Gordon then shot the Hispanic boy, decapitated him, and then forced the now 15-year-old Sanford to burn the head in a fire pit and then crush the skull. Gordon used quicklime to quickly decompose the body and the bones were left out in the desert. I mean, these two years passed by in the blink of an eye. Sanford, now 15, had permanent damage to his backside from the constant assaults from Gordon, who used himself and objects. He had also stopped growing from the malnutrition and most likely stress, so he was still very small for his age. Other boys had come and gone, assaulted and murdered at the hands of Gordon Northcott. Then one day, Gordon returned to the chicken farm with nine-year-old Walter Collins. Now, although every single young victim deserves to be remembered and mourned, let's talk about this particular victim. There is a movie about this incident in history called Changeling that stars Angelina Jolie. It is about how Walter's mother, Christine Collins, dealt with his disappearance. On March 10th, 1928, Christine, being a single mother, had to work that day. And though she didn't like having to leave Walter alone, she really didn't have a lot of options. So she gave him some money to go to the movie theater to entertain himself in her absence. Upon her return, Walter was nowhere to be found. The LA Police Department, already pretty well known for their corruption, told her that he most likely ran away, but Christine knew better. They even tried to bring her another random boy that loosely fit Walter's description, and she had to fight that as well. Gordon Northcott, after kidnapping Walter, told Sanford to sleep out in the chicken house for a couple of nights. Sanford knew why. He tried to warn Walter to not fight what was about to happen to him, that it would, quote, make things easier, unquote. Gordon took Walter into the house where he beat, tortured, and raped him for days. Also, during the time Walter was there, Gordon's mother, Sarah, had come to the farm to visit, believing that there were sick chickens that she needed to tend to. Needless to say, she found young Walter and demanded Gordon tell her why that young boy was there. Gordon told her that he just could not help himself. She told them that Walter had to die because the police already knew that he was missing and that shooting him would be too loud and might call attention from the neighbors. I mean, this is ridiculous. She said that they would all bludgeon him to death so that each would be implicated. They then proceeded to mutilate and dispose of his little body. Not long after, Gordon forced Sanford to come along with him to kidnap another young boy, but instead Gordon took two brothers, Lewis and Nelson Winslow, as they walked home from a yacht club meeting. They too were kept locked in the chicken coop with cots to sleep on and in between times of torture and rape. The boys' parents also began receiving strange letters from them. The first letter said that they were heading to Mexico, and the second said that they plan to stay missing as long as they can to become famous. What was really happening was indescribable suffering. Once Gordon had had his fill, their heads were bludgeoned, decapitated, and disposed of in the same manner as the others. Gordon and his mother had also forced young Sanford to write the occasional letter home to his mother Winifred, telling her that he was fine and that everything was good. Winifred's daughter Jessie intercepted a letter, reading it along with her father, and both felt very suspicious about the well-being of Sanford. I mean, the letters were entirely too happy with what they knew about Gordon. So, Jessie decided to travel from Canada to the farm to check on her baby brother. Her gut was telling her that something was very, very wrong, and she had always adored Sanford. She traveled by boat down to Los Angeles, then rode a bus to Pasadena, 
and had telegrammed ahead so that Gordon would know to come pick her up. When he did, he made no effort to hide his anger that she had come to interrupt his fun. Once they arrived at the farm, Jessie immediately exited the car and began walking the property to look for her little brother. Sanford could hear her calling for him, but he was so scared and so anxious, he stayed hidden and quiet for just a bit. But eventually he came out and she ran and hugged him, loved on him, but he could not bring himself to hug her back, nor could he maintain even a little bit of eye contact with her. And needless to say, it did not go unnoticed. During her visit, Gordon did everything he could to keep the siblings from talking. But once he was asleep, talk they did. Eventually, Jessie was able to get Sanford to tell her what had been happening on that farm. She saw the horrible scarring on his back from that boiling water. She had also seen the little blood spots in his underwear. She was livid, but Sanford begged her, he begged her to act like she had no idea that that would be safer for both of them. And she agreed. Once it was time for her to leave, Gordon drove the three of them into LA to Sarah and George's house. Without warning, Jessie exclaimed that she was taking Sanford back with her to Canada. And Gordon became so enraged that he punched her in the side of her head, knocking her out of her chair. And her grandparents did nothing. Now Sanford loved his sister dearly and he tried to leap forward to her aid, George stopping him for some reason. But he did tell his uncle Gordon that he would talk to her and he would get her to leave, he promised. So Gordon agreed, and once they were alone, Jesse tried to give Sanford some money to catch a train that would take him to Seattle once she left. She made him swear that he would sneak out of their grandparents' home and catch that train that very night. Sanford agreed, he nodded and smiled, but he was so conditioned by Gordon that he was too terrified to actually leave. And once she was gone, Sarah and Gordon became frantic. They knew that Jesse would alert the authorities once she got home. They began packing, walking circles around young Sanford. George helped, but he had no intention of leaving his home. He was angry that his wife and son had put all of them into this predicament and he was not going to leave his house. But they all piled into Gordon's car, they drove out to the farm, and over the next day or two, they began selling everything, anything that anyone would buy, the livestock, the equipment, I mean everything. And once they had all of the money, they got back into Gordon's car, save Sanford. Sarah and Gordon told Sanford to stay on the land and that they'd be back for him. But of course the teen knew better. Now, just as predicted, once Jessie got home, she contacted the American consulate. And not long after, two immigration officers visited the chicken farm where they encountered Sanford sitting on the steps of the house, alone. The teen was terrified because his uncle had told him the entire time that he had been on that farm that if Gordon was caught, they'd know that Sanford had helped him with the boys and he'd receive either the death penalty or be treated 10 times worse in prison by other inmates. But once 15 year old Sanford was convinced that the authorities could keep him safe from his uncle, he told them that Gordon had kidnapped, molested, raped and beaten him for two years and that he had done the same to several other boys upwards of 20 or possibly more, forcing Sanford to help him. He also said that his grandmother had been a willing accomplice in the murder of Walter Collins. Sanford told the investigators where evidence might be found on the farm and what they did find was horrid beyond measure. They sifted through the dirt in the places that Sanford had told them to look and found countless charred bits of bone. Sanford told them that Gordon sometimes made him dig up remains so that Gordon could move them out into the desert. Now, by this point, 
Gordon and Sarah were nearly back to Canada, though it didn't take long for them to be found and extradited back to the States. Sarah immediately admitted to murdering Walter Collins, but then retracted. George was arrested in his LA home as well. Gordon Northcott's trial began in January of 1929. He fired several attorneys and decided to defend himself. This, of course, meant that Sanford was forced to face his uncle one last time. Only now that he knew he was safe from him and had been assured that the authorities understood why he had helped Gordon kill and get rid of the bodies, he had the confidence to look his uncle straight in the eye. He had made a full-time job of being able to read his uncle's face, his body language, and voice so as to minimize his own suffering at Gordon's hands, and he could tell his uncle was floundering. Gordon tried his best to trip Sanford up on his testimony, but it was no good. No one in that courtroom fell for his lies, and he was sentenced to death by hanging. Now, Sarah, Gordon's mother, during her trial, said she was actually Gordon's grandmother because her husband had raped her daughter, Winifred, and Gordon was Winifred's son. Gordon himself also claimed to have had incestuous relationships with his mother and that his father had molested him when he was 10. Also, when Winifred found out about the whole story, what her own son had been subjected to once her brother made it back to Canada, she chose to help him try to escape detection rather than help her own son. Sarah was sentenced to life in prison. But while Gordon Northcott was sitting in prison, awaiting his sentence, he sent a telegram to Walter Collins' mother, saying that if she came to see him in jail, he would tell her what happened to her boy. But once she came, Gordon refused to speak with her. Christine Collins never gave up hope that her son was still alive. Gordon was executed by hanging on October 2nd, 1930. He was 23 years old when he died. Sarah was again sentenced to life in prison at San Quentin. However, she was paroled in May of 1940 at 71 years old, and then she died four years later. These murders were referred to as the Wineville Chicken Coop Murders. The town changed its name to Miraloma to try to escape the stigma of the crimes. And whatever happened to young Sanford? He was never formally tried for any of the crimes on that farm. It was completely understood that his participation was only under extreme duress and coercion from Gordon. He was sent to the Whittier Boys School for the rest of his time being a minor. He acclimated to the environment very well after a while. He received medical treatment and they did the best that they could to help him heal. His immune system was compromised during his time on that farm and he did suffer with flu-like symptoms for quite a while, but he did make a healthy comeback. He worked hard at his studies at the school and learning various trades and the staff of the school were very impressed by him. And once he was released, he went back to Canada he actually served in World War II admirably. He got married and he worked for the Canadian Postal Service. However, he refused to have any biological children of his own. He was terrified that whatever was wrong with his family was in his genes. So he and his wife adopted two boys and he was known to be an excellent father. And the weight of the crimes that he witnessed and knew about in those short two years stayed with him his entire life on his deathbed when his sons told them how much they loved him. He still held the weight of those crimes and said, why would you? Sanford died in 1991 when he was 78 years old. So as horrible as these two years were for him, I'm sure we can all agree that it is wonderful to know that Sanford did have a good life after. So, 
It seems his parents knew about his affinity for young boys and helped him build a place where he could explore his horrid sexual fantasies. While I don't think Gordon's father was okay with this, I think Sarah just mentally beat George down into complete compliance. I also think Sarah might not have agreed with his issues, but she figured if they put him somewhere, it would be a kind of out of sight, out of mind situation. As far as Winifred goes, I will never understand how she could give her little brother her own child, most likely knowing what would happen to him, or at least have an idea of what might happen to him. Then she later tried to help Gordon escape justice. I mean, what even is that? But what do you think? Leave me a comment on Instagram at serial underscore killing or YouTube under the same name of this podcast. You can visit my website at serialkilling.squarespace.com and also consider sponsoring the podcast. It takes a lot of time and a lot of work to gather this info, but I do enjoy it. And thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it as I know you could listen to anyone else, but you chose me. Have a great day. Music by Kevin MacLeod on Incompetech.com.